these vaccines, even if they don't offer complete protection, they keep people out of severe illness and out of the hospital. That's clearly a win. Hello, I'm Faith Rogers, host of today's program, COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. This is a December 16th update of DKB Med Radio's Coronavirus Educational Series. Thank you for joining us. As a note to our regular listeners, this will be our final week of episodes in the year 2020. We will resume our regularly scheduled episodes on Wednesday, January 6th of 2021. We encourage you to take this opportunity to listen to previously uncompleted episodes or view our other free CE, CME programs on a wide variety of topics at dkbmed.com. This activity is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, DKB Med, and the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. Today's program is accredited for ANCC and AAPA credit, as well as AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete CE information. If you're tuning into our webcast, please click the red Claim Credit button in the webinar console to attest for credit. Otherwise, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. Today's learning objectives are discuss efficacy of baricitinib in combination with remdesivir and describe similarities and differences of the two mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. With us today, we have Dr. Paul Awater, Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Dr. Awater, we're happy to have you back. Yeah, thank you, Faith. I thought I would uh, spend a few minutes today just uh, catching up a little bit as a number of studies have been published, uh, not only in preliminary, but also in final form. And the standards of care, if you could call them that for COVID-19, are subtly changing. And I just wanted to point some of those out. Perhaps the guidelines that are looked at most are the National Institutes of Health COVID-19 guidelines. And they have this useful graphic with the color bars that you see here. And certainly the two drugs that we have ended up speaking a lot about for our hospitalized patients are the antiviral remdesivir, as well as the anti-inflammatory dexamethasone. And what's happened or some changes are that at least for the moment, if you have someone in the hospital that you think has uh, acute coronavirus infection, but they don't require oxygen at the moment, there's no compelling data to suggest that you need to use remdesivir, even though it is FDA approved for use. And I think it's a judgment call, uh, whether you use it perhaps for your high risk patients and so on, but no formal recommendations. And dexamethasone should not be used mainly because of a trend towards worse outcomes that we know from the recovery trial. Now, perhaps the biggest bar is the gold bar here, and that's for patients who are hospitalized, but they do require oxygen, uh, uh, generally a low or high flow, but not ill enough to land in the ICU with non-invasive uh, ventilation, mechanical ventilation, or ECMO. And in that group, uh, remdesivir is recommended. That's what uh, appeared to have most benefit in the ACT-1 trial. But interestingly, now that the final report's been graded, the initial NIH guideline listed it its top category as A1, but in fact, it's now, as you can see here, B2A. So it's been downgraded a little bit. And I think some of that acknowledges just the impact of the solidarity trial, even though there are lots of problems with the solidarity trial. It is large, didn't have a length of stay or mortality benefit, but there's still lots of issues. So on balance, I still think remdesivir has a place here. Uh, and then dexamethasone can be combined at this stage with some improvement uh, in mortality. Now, once you get to the ICU in the gray bar or even more ill in the red bar, dexamethasone is clearly the treatment of choice at the moment, uh, perhaps with remdesivir, although the effect really is uh, not very uh, clear cut or strong. So that's sort of the update. I think the major changes are just on the, the remdesivir and or the dexamethasone angle there. So 
basically what's happened is NIH looked at the ACT1 trial and said, look, we're not going to strongly recommend remdesivir or recommend it actually in uh, people in the ICU, but only in patients that uh, need supplemental oxygen, perhaps on a floor. The IDSA guideline, which is also looked to and very good, hasn't quite updated itself yet, but that's, I think they will likely come to the same conclusion. There are going to be four of the ACTT uh, NIAD trials. Uh, we've talked a lot about ACT1 with remdesivir. This is the ACT2 trial that looked at a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, that's baricitinib, uh, versus just remdesivir alone for people that are hospitalized for uh, COVID-19. And the primary endpoint was median time to recovery, same as in ACT1. And there was a statistically significant difference, but only really one day, as you can see, a uh, change from eight to seven days if you added the baricitinib. Uh, only a low percentage of patients got dexamethasone as well. Uh, so that probably didn't have a big impact if you're wondering uh, about that. There was some additional information that suggested that some patients uh, were less likely to progress to ventilation or death uh, at the end of the study at day 29 in terms of uh, the active measurement. And the subgroups who had most benefit uh, were interestingly somewhat close to the same as remdesivir, um, that is with either supplemental or high flow oxygen uh, with lower mortality rates noted there. And this is borne out a bit more easily in this graphic. Uh, if you remember ACT1 and remdesivir, it's the same ordinal system here where uh, they grade uh, the severity of illness. And uh, the group that benefited most was the ordinal six. Those are people that required high flow oxygen or non-invasive ventilation uh, in panel D, uh, perhaps a, a bit in uh, ordinal number five or panel C, but not so much in groups four. And you can see the overall effect, but mostly driven I would say, by uh, ordinal six. However, for the sicker population, there was really no effect. And so very interesting compared to the dexamethasone effect, which we would have anticipated. Now, where does that leave us with this uh, drug, which was approved for rheumatoid arthritis or has been approved by the FDA for rheumatoid arthritis um, as a targeted anti-inflammatory? And so I, I think this is the conclusion that makes sense at the moment. Uh, you know, there's some modest benefit, but you would use it where you wouldn't want to use dexamethasone. Uh, perhaps a patient who had uh, uh, a diabetic ketoacidosis or so on, uh, you would want to combine it with remdesivir in non-intubated patients that require oxygen. And uh, they recommend against the use of this drug if you don't combine it with remdesivir except in a clinical trial because we don't have much information in that regard. So those are the updates of FAITH. Um, I think uh, we've been focusing a lot on the hospitalized patients. Um, there are still, of course, the monoclonal antibodies that are available by referral uh, in uh, your state to look at for your mild to moderate patients who are not hospitalized uh, there. But again, we don't have robust amounts of information backing its use, but uh, probably has a place that maybe we'll uh, learn more about with uh, expanded trials. But um, I know uh, the other big news, of course, is we're really moving on the vaccine front. The BioNTech Pfizer message RNA vaccine um, has rolled out with an emergency use authorization from the FDA. It appears during this um, second week of December that uh, the Food and Drug Administration will be soon uh, issuing an EUA as well uh, for the Moderna one. So uh, Faith, um, I think we have one question for today. Yes, we do. And how funny that it does happen to be about that vaccine. So great. Um, what are some similarities and differences with the Moderna mRNA vaccine compared to the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine? So there's been, uh, Faith, a lot of discussion about the, the two vaccines. And I would say they're, uh, as a patient, I would look at them as very similar. They have the same mechanisms of action. And even though this is a novel platform, what I would think of this as is instead of getting 
uh, you know, a live attenuated virus vaccine like measles or mumps, what you're doing is you're just getting one gene of a virus and it's in this lipid formulation, which is very similar to what might be the envelope of a virus. So you're really getting a mini virus and the RNA doesn't hang around very long. Uh, a lot's been written about this already. I think many of you already know the Moderna one doesn't require the Antarctic conditions for storage. It can be stored at minus 20 degrees, but it too it seems to have about 95% efficacy overall, Faith. So this is very comparable to the uh, Pfizer mRNA vaccine. In a briefing document supplied to the FDA that I looked over just last night, it does suggest that perhaps this vaccine in the phase three trial to date is slightly less effective uh, than the Pfizer vaccine in the group over the age of 65. They had a 86.4% efficacy there, still excellent. And the other thing, at least for the Moderna vaccine, looked like it may have helped prevent serious illness, maybe a hair more than Pfizer, although the numbers are very small. What's important to notice, uh, I think, is that these vaccines, even if they don't offer complete protection, they keep people out of severe illness and out of the hospital. That's clearly a win. And, and that's also what we think of influenza, right? It's not the, the most efficacious vaccine in terms of complete protection, but it decreases risks of serious influenza, hospitalization, and death. So um, if these two vaccines accomplish that, that would be tremendous. Uh, the Moderna vaccine had probably comparable to maybe slightly higher rates of non-serious adverse reactions, but the Moderna vaccine also did very well recruiting groups such as uh, people of color, um, men and women, and so on. So uh, the only difference is with the Moderna, it's uh, people 18 and older, whereas the Pfizer vaccine had a handful of people uh, that were adolescents 16 and older. So overall, I think um, this will likely be approved. I would view them very comparably as the vaccines are rolled out uh, in your state. You'll just need to uh, watch the news and websites for, especially if you're in high-risk groups, that might be in the second phase of rollout, which will hopefully happen this winter after phase one uh, priority. So very encouraging news, and uh, we'll just see how the logistics are, are handled. We're still in those early phases, Faith. Dr. Allwater, thank you again for those updates. If you're tuning into our webcast, please click the red claim credit button in the webinar console to attest for credit. Otherwise, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. Any questions or issues, feel free to email us at the address listed. To submit questions, please send them to qa at dkbmed.com. That's Q as in question, A as in answer, at dkbmed.com. Again, thanks for joining us, and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19. Thanks again, Dr. Allwater. Yeah, Faith, I wish all of you a very safe and happy holiday season, and I, I feel fairly confident that although 2020 was a terrible year, that the worst is hopefully behind us, and I think each month that passes in 2021 will get better. So. Uh, wishing you all the best.